السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا Continue with Zad al-Mustaqna of Imam al-Hajjawi and in the book of Janais the rulings and ahkam pertaining to the funeral prayer etc Today we have the fasl, we have the section which is going to talk about the ghusl how to make ghusl of the mayyid so the Imam, may Allah have mercy upon him, he says, غُسُلْ مَيِّتْ وَتَكْفِينُهُ وَالصَّلَاةُ عَلَيْهِ وَدَفْنُهُ فَرْضُ كِفَايَةٍ That to give the ghusl to the dead, to shroud the dead, to pray salah upon the dead, to bury the dead, so these four matters are fardu kifaya, meaning that they're a communal obligation. So if one person or a group of people uh, suffice this activity, then this is lifted from the next of the community that know that know about the need for this uh, act to be fulfilled. An important point here to mention, as Sheikh Samir Suqayl mentions, that a mistake some people make with regards to this funeral prayer is that those who wash the body at times, they may decide a group of them to pray over the body in the place where they have washed the body, in the maghsala. So here's a problem now. Because why? Once they've prayed upon this uh, body, then the fardu kifaya, the communal obligation is now lifted. So when that body is now taken to the masjid and the people pray upon it again in the masjid, this prayer now, the janazah salah in the masjid is going to be a sunnah. It's not going to be the fardu kifaya. So it's going to be less in martaba. It's going to be less in level than the fardu kifaya. So as Sheikh Sami Suqayl mentions in his explanation of Rawd al he says it's better for those who are washing the body to not pray upon the body. Rather, they should pray with the rest of the jama'ah, the jama'ah that has gathered, gathered in the masjid, so that all of them can get the reward of the fardu kifaya. In Rawd al in the explanation of Zad al Mustaqni of uh, Imam Bahuti, ta'ala, he mentions that there is a fifth fardu kifaya. So we mentioned four of them, and in Rawd al there's mentioned a fifth of them where he says and to carry the body is also a fardu kifaya to carry the body is also a fardu kifaya what is the proof for this with a fiqh rule think of a fiqh rule that we have taken quite often what can be that fiqh rule to prove this fardu kifaya that to carry the body is also a fardu kifaya so based upon the four things that we've mentioned, thinking about that, and then thinking about a fiqh rule to prove this fifth one that we have just mentioned, which is to carry the body. Question to yourselves. So the fiqh rule, as we know, is مَا لَا يَتِمُ الْوَاجِبِ إِلَّا بِهِ فَهُوَ wajib. That by which the obligation is not met except through it, then that also becomes an obligation, right? This is what the fiqh rule means. So in order to get the body to the grave, as you just mentioned, then it needs to be carried. Hamluhu ila al-maqbara. Okay, it's also fadlu kifaya. And based upon the rule, ma la yatimu al-wajib illa bihi fahuwa wajib. That by which the obligation is not achieved except through it, then that also becomes an obligation. Tayyib. Another thing to mention here is that it's makru, according to Imam Ahmed, to take uh, al-ujra, to take a payment for these services, for the ghusl, for the uh, preparation of the body, for its burial, etc. It's makru. And Sheikh Sami Suqair in his explanation of Rawdul Murbi, he said that when Imam Ahmed Rahimullah Ta'ala stated something to be makru, he didn't mean it in the technicality that we understand today. That makru is something that if you leave it off, you're rewarded. But if you do it, then that is um, not punishable. Rather, Imam Ahmad Rahimullah Ta'ala, when he would mention that something is, is makru, he would state explicitly that something was makru, he would here mean that it is haram. So he didn't want to use the word haram because it's not found in the kitab or the sunnah as being explicitly stated as it's haram, but he would rule it to be impermissible, and instead of saying haram, he would use the word makru. So there's a difference in the technicality that we understand today, as it was understood by some of the fuqaha of the past. Tayyib, so we said it's, it's uh, makru, and in fact Imam Ahmed means it's uh, tahrim, it's haram to take a payment for these services. However, if the services are done in a way of uh, um, non-contractual form, 
non-contractually that uh, somebody makes an announcement is there anybody who can help with the janaza and they will be paid x y and z so a contract wasn't made specifically or it's done from a waqf a waqf endowment or it's taken from the bayt al-mal if uh, in the cases that there is nobody else there to help for free so in these situations it would be okay to take money in these manners non-contractually or it's done from a waqf or it's taken from the bayt al-mal in the situation that there's nobody else there to help the author, Rahimullah Ta'ala, he says, nas bi ghuslihi That the most preferred person to do the ghusl of the dead is the wasiyuhu, is the one that has been mentioned in the will of this dead person. Thumma abuhu. And after this person next comes in preference, is the father of this person. Thumma jadduhu. And after that, the grandfather. Thumma al-aqrab fal aqrab min asabatihi. Then the closest in terms of relations from the paternal relatives then the closest in terms of the maternal uh, parental relatives so to wash the dead first and foremost is the wasiyah and this is taken from the fact that Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu had his wife wash him after he had passed away he left the wasiyah he left it in his will that his wife would do it for him and also one of the ta'aleels mentioned by the scholars such as Sheikh Ahmed Khalil is that the person, if he has stated in his will that such and such person should wash me or, and take care of my funeral arrangements, then it means that the dead had full trust in this person. And because the dead had full trust in this person, this person is to be preferred above all else. If there's no wasiyah and the family cannot agree on who should be next, then the next person to take care of the ghusl and the funeral arrangements is the father. Because the father is the most emotion, emotionally attached to the child okay this is what the ulama say due to the emotional attachment that the father has to a child then this person the father is next in line after the one who is mentioned in the will if the father is not there for whatever reason then it would be the grandfather because the grandfather is similar to the father okay after that after the grandfather next number four is the son or the grandson and number five is the brother of the deceased the brother of the deceased and number six is du arhamihi those who come from the mother's side, like Akhul um, Um, like the, um, the mother's brother, Wa Jaddul Um, or the grandfather of the mother, Wa Amlil Um, or the uncle of the mother, Wa Ibnul Ukht, and then going to the son of the sister. This tartib that we've mentioned, this order that we've mentioned from the wasiyah onwards, the wasiyah, the father, uh, the grandfather, the son, etc. This is in the case that any of those people mentioned first in the order have the ability and the knowledge to do the ghusl and the other funeral rites. If they don't have the ability and the knowledge of how to do it, then it would go to the next person in the order that we have mentioned. And of course, if there is a group of people that are known in the community to do the washing and to do the takfin and to prepare the funeral, then those people can obviously be um, you know, brought forward to do these funeral rites and it doesn't have to be uh, from the people that we mentioned. The author he says, Rahimahullah So with regards to the female, again it's her wasiya, it's the one that she mentions in the will. And after them, then it would be Al-Qurba, those closest in relative, in relation to her. Fal-Qurba min nisa'iha. And then it would be those who are closest from uh, the women related to her. So the first of them is the wasiya that I mentioned in the will. Then the close, closest of her female relatives, her mother, her grandmother, etc. And then the third would be her daughter and the granddaughter, etc. And then the fourth, any relatives that they come as they come in the issue of mirath the issue of inheritance in the same tartib, in the same order mentioned in the issues of mirath. The author he says, And it's permissible for each of the married couple, whether it be the husband or the wife, whoever passes away and whoever is left can uh, make ghusl for the dead from the two. So if a wife passes away, the husband, he can do the ghusl. And if the husband passes away, the wife that is still alive can do the ghusl. It's narrated in Ahmad that uh, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to our mother, Aisha radiallahu anha, wa ma darraki law mitti qabli fa And don't worry that if you were to die before me, 
I would do the washing for you. I would wash you if you were to die before me. And as we mentioned, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu was washed by his wife and Ali radiallahu anhu washed Fatima radiallahu anha, the daughter of the Prophet sallallahu Question to yourselves, think about this. When would it not be permissible for a wife to wash the husband or a husband to wash the wife? In which situation would it not be permissible for the spouses to wash one of the other? So as we said, the woman has the full right to wash her husband, as does the husband have the full right to wash the uh, wife. Okay, And uh, in fact, some of the ulama, they said it's better that the husband washes the wife uh, rather than anybody else because he's closest to her. And the wife washed the husband because she's closest to him, even after death, because the athar is still there after death. However, pertaining to my question, when is it not permissible for the wife to wash the husband or the husband to wash the wife? If she was a non-Muslim, okay, like a Christian wife, then the husband cannot wash her. Why? Because it's not allowed for a Muslim to wash and to bury a non-Muslim. Tayyib. So in this situation, the husband cannot wash her or bury her. And also, if he has passed away, then this non-Muslim wife, the Christian wife, cannot wash the husband. Why? Because this washing is an act of ibadah. And an act of ibadah needs a niyyah, needs an intention. And the act of ibadah and the niyyah is not going to be there from a non-Muslim. Okay? And this was mentioned by Sheikh Sami al suqair in his explanation of Rawd al-Murbi'ah. The author, he says, وَقَوْلُهُ وَكَذَا سَيِّدٌ مَعَ سُرِّيَّتِهِ and likewise, a slave owner can wash his dead female slave if he had relation with her. If he had sexual, physical relations with her and she passes away, then the slave owner is allowed to wash uh, the woman that has passed away. Dorothy says, وَلِرَجُلٍ وَمْرَأَةٍ غُسْلُ مَنْ لَهُ دُونَ سَبْعِ سِنِينَ فَقَطْ And it's permissible for a man and a woman to wash a child that is under the age of seven years old only. Meaning that regardless of the sex of the child that is under the age of seven, a man and a woman can wash that child, okay? Even if they are not closely related to that child. What is the illa? What is the cause for the ruling that allows this ruling? What is the illa? What is the cause for allowing this ruling? That a man and woman can wash a child under the age of seven regardless of the gender. Because the child has no aura, okay? And th under the age of seven, the child has no aura. And also, it's mentioned that when uh, the son of Rasulullah sallam, Ibrahim passed away, then women who were not related to him washed him. Okay, so in this, these are two proofs that it's permissible. Ibn Qudama rahimullah ta'ala from the Imams of the Madhab, of the Hanbali Madhab, and the Imams of Ahl Sunnah, Rahimullah Ta'ala, he said that a tifla, uh, a young child, a female child under the age of seven, should not be washed by a man. Okay, should not be washed by a man according to the opinion of Ibn Qudama, as mentioned by Sheikh Ahmed Khalil in his explanation of Zad al Mustaqna. Tayyip, the author he says, Wa in mata rajulun bayna niswatin aw aksuhu yumimmat. If a man dies and amongst him or his only the only people that find or come across his dead body are women that are not related to him. Or the opposite scenario, a woman dies and the only people that come across her body are men that are not related to her. Then what should take place in this situation is not a ghusl, but rather what is to take place is tayammum. So how is this done? The person who finds the body or the people that find the body, uh, they make tayammum with a glove or a wrap of cloth around their hands. So what they do, is that they hit the ground with their hands and then they wipe the face of the dead person and the hands of the dead person. So the one who is making tayammum, he has gloves or he has a wrap on his hand or her hand and they hit the ground and then with whatever comes left on their hands, they wipe the face of the dead person and the hands of the dead person. The author, he says, Kakuntha mushkilin, like the one whose uh, gender is not clear the hermaphrodite, the one whose gender is not clear. Okay, because if it turns out that she was a man or it was a man, then it wouldn't be allowed for women to touch this body. 
and if it turns out that it's a woman then it's not, not allowed for men to touch the body so the khuntha mushkil the one whose gender is not clearly developed or has two genders then it's only allowed to make tayammum for this person uh, and not to uh, make ghusl for this person in the absence of that person's close relatives the author he says وَيَحْمُوا أَنْ يُغَسِّلَ مُسْلِمٌ كَافِرًا أَوْ, يدفن أو يدفنه. And it's not permissible, as we touched upon, it's not permissible for a Muslim to make ghusl of a kafir, okay? Or to bury that person. Why? Because in Surah Tawbah, it's mentioned that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا تُصَلِّ عَلَىٰ أَحَدٍ مِّنْهُمْ مَاتَ أَبَدًا وَلَا تَقُمْ عَلَىٰ قَبْرِهِنْ إِنَّهُمْ, ك... إنهم كَفَرُوا بِاللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says وَلَا تُصَلِّ عَلَىٰ أَحَدٍ مِّنْهُمْ مَاتَ أَبَدًا Don't pray, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam among, upon any of those non-Muslims that died وَلَا تَقُمْ عَلَىٰ قَبْرِهِ and don't stand over his grave making dua for him إِنَّهُمْ كَفَرُوا بِاللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ Verily they disbelieved in Allah and the Rasul وَمَاتُ وَهُمْ فَاسِقُونَ and they died whilst being in a state of disobedience and disbelief to Allah azza wa jal Okay, so what's the wajhu dalala from this ayah that I just recited? What's the point of evidence, the point of proof to show that the uh, Muslim cannot wash the non Muslim? What's the wajhu dalala? Because it doesn't mention washing, right? It's, it says, And don't pray upon any of those who have died from amongst the mushrikeen, from amongst the non Muslims. So what's the point of evidence to say that you cannot uh, wash the dead non-Muslim? Barakallahu feek, zakallahu khair. So the ulama, they say something very similar to this. And they say that the illa, the wajhu dalala, the point of evidence is as such. وَصَلَاةُ عَنْفَ مَا يُفْعَلْ لِلْمَيِّدِ That the salah is the most beneficial thing that you can do for the dead person. So in the ayah it was mentioned, do not make the salah for the dead person. فَغَيْرُهَا مِمَّا هُوَ دُونُهَا مِنْ بَابِ الْأُولَى so other actions which are less than the salah are more so prohibited. So more so prohibited is the fact that you cannot do ghusl for the dead, Muslim, uh, for the dead uh, kafir because if you cannot even pray for the dead kafir, which is the most beneficial act that can be done for a dead person, then any actions which are below that, below the prayer, from ghusl and takfin and carrying the body, etc., cannot be done. Another riwayah in the madhab, as mentioned by Sheikh Hamad al hamad in his explanation of Zad al-Mustaqni'ah, is that if the kafir has nobody else to wash, okay, nobody else to wash this person and nobody else to bury this person, then in this situation it can be done because ihsan towards a non-Muslim is permitted. Goodness towards a non-Muslim when there is need is permitted as long as the person is not a harbi. If the person is a harbi, meaning one at war with the Muslims, then it wouldn't be allowed according to this second opinion in the matter. The author he says, بَلْ يُوَارَى لِعَدَمِ مَنْ يُوَارِيهِ Rather this person who is not to be washed and not to be buried, the non-Muslim, they are just to be entered into the ground and they are to be covered up so that the harm of the stench of the dead body is taken away from the community, right? If there's nobody from amongst the family of this dead non-Muslim to take care of the funeral rites, then when this body is found, what the Muslims would do, they would bury this person. وَإِذْ أَخَذَ فِي غُسْلِهِ سَتَرَ عَوْرَتَهُ وَجَرَّدَهُ وَسَتَرَهُ عَنِ الْعُيُونِ So when the person, the people who are dealing with the dead body's uh, ghusl, when they start to wash the dead body, they must ensure that the awra is covered. And the awra of this person is covered by a cloth of some sort or a towel. وَجَرَّدَهُ And then they take off the other outer garments. وَسَتَرَهُ عَنِ الْعُيُونِ And they ensure that those who are not involved or those who don't have to be there for the washing, uh, they should not be allowed to see the dead body because this is a time of sitr. This is a time when the person's uh, honor and their privacy should be protected. So the awrah has to be covered and the clothes have to be removed in order not to um, speed up the decomposition, the, the decay of the body. And as we just touched upon, it's uh, disliked, it's makru for the one who is not there to help with the washing of the body to be present because it's a time of sitr, it's a time where the uh, dead person's honor is to be protected uh, extremely.
قوله ثم يرفع رأسه إلى قرب جلوسه ويعسر بطنه برفق The author he says that the dead person after having the aura covered and having the clothes removed then they are uh, brought to close to a sitting position they are brought to close to a sitting position and the stomach is pressed gently the stomach of the dead person is pressed gently and the reason is pressed gently because if there was anything in the stomach that was ready to come out then it would come out through the normal passages and it would be washed away the author he says وَيُكْثِرُ صُبُّ الْمَا هِينَئِذٍ and at this point when the stomach is being pressed and something expected to come out from the uh, passages of excretion then extra water would be poured around the body uh, in particular around the private parts so then that filth can be washed away okay and some of the ulama they said that bukhur should also be in the room uh, if filth is found to be exiting from the body so as to remove the stench uh, that is found therein the author he says and then the people they ensure that their hands are wrapped with gloves or some type of wrap around uh, their hands and they clean the private area so the ulama they mentioned that there should be at least two wraps one for cleaning the private area and one for uh, if najasa comes out and one for cleaning the rest of the body وَلَا يَحِلُّ مَسُّ عَوْرَةِ مَنْ لَهُ سَبْعُ سِنِينَ And it's not permissible to touch the awra of the one who is seven years and above, meaning that you cannot touch the skin of the awra. It has to be via a wrap or a glove. وَيُسْتَحَبُّ أَنْ لَا يَمَسَّ سَائِرَهُ إِلَّا بِخِرْقَةٍ And it's recommended that the rest of the body, apart from the awra, is not touched except with a wrap or a glove, meaning that again, the skin of the hand should not touch that body. Rather, it's recommended that gloves be used or wraps be used. ثُمَّ Then, after the private part of that person is cleaned, uh, the person, uh, the dead body, wudu is made for them. Mandub, uh, uh, something which is recommended, not wajib. وَلَا يُدْخِلُ الْمَا فِي فِيهِ And, uh, whilst making this wudu, water is not to be put into the mouth of that dead person neither is water to be put into the nose question why is water not to be put into the mouth why is madhubadha not to be made for the dead person with water put into the mouth or the nose question to yourselves why the reason water is not to be put into the mouth or the nose is because it will lead into the stomach and this may cause anything which is in the stomach which wasn't easily coming out then to want to come out so the ulama they say it may cause the najasa uh, to come out. The author he says, وَيُدْخِلُوا إِسْبَعِيهِ مَبْلُولَتَيْنِ بِالْمَا بَيْنَ شَفَتَيْ فَيَمْسَهُ أَسْنَانَهُ So what the people, person who is uh, washing the body does, he ensures that his fingers are wet and he takes uh, the water that is on his fingers and he kind of moves them between the lips of the dead person and the teeth of the dead person. And also he puts water uh, on his fingertips into the nostrils of the dead person. But he doesn't put any water actually into the nostrils rather. So he's getting water on his, the remnants of the water on his hand, wiping the, the lips and the teeth and also remnants of water on his hand, uh, using that to clean the nostrils of the dead person, but not actually entering water into those parts. And after having done this wudu, the intention for ghusl is made, because without the intention, the act of worship cannot stand. The uh, niya for the ghusl is made. وَيُسَمِّي And the basmala is said, wujuban. Okay, the basmala is said, uh, wujuban, it's a must. وَيَغْسِلُوا بِرَغْوَةِ سِدْرِ رَأْسَهُ وَلِحْيَتَهُ فَقَدْ رَغْوَةَ سِدْر is used to make ghusl of the head and the beard of this person. Okay? رَغْوَةَ سِدْر Sidr are these load leaves. They are brought and they are crushed and then they are mixed with water and the foam that is left at the top of this uh, mixture, this is used to wash the, uh, the hair of the head and also the lahya of the beard. The reason this is uh, used is because that it's easy to wash away it's easy to wash away however many of the ulama they said that if this is not available you can use shampoo in its place the author he says ثُمَّ ثُمَّ الْأَيْسَرْ ثُمَّ كُلَّهُ ثلاثن. and then after washing the head 
okay, and the, and the face and the beard, then the person's right side is washed and the left side is washed and each of this is done three times. Why? Because in the hadith in Bukhari in Muslim, the Prophet ﷺ said, when one of his daughters passed away, Begin with the right side of her and the places and the spots of wudu uh, on her. طيب. The author he says, And every time from amongst the three or more that the ghusl is made for the person, again, gently the stomach is rubbed or pressed uh, to ensure that there's nothing left that wants to come out except that it comes out. The author he says, If the body is not cleansed after three ghusls, three washes, then you can increase the cleaning, even if it means that you go above seven. However, it's recommended to stop upon witr. So if you find that you clean the body four times and that was enough to cleanse the body, then it's recommended to add one more washing so that you stop on a witr number. The author says, وَيَجْعَلُوا فِي غَسْلَةِ الْأَخِيرَةِ كَافُورِ وَالْمَاءَ الْحَارِ وَالْأَشْنَانِ in the, uh, in the last of the washing of the body, you put uh, kafur. Kafur is put there because it gives a nice smell to the body. And uh, hot water is used if there is a need. Meaning to say that if there's something on the body which is not being removed except with hot water, or if it's extremely cold and hot water needs to be used, then you would use hot water. Otherwise, you would just use lukewarm water. Well, ashnan. Ashnan would be used, uh, yani, it's also a type of plant from the desert which is crushed and it helps to remove any uh, dirt, stubborn dirt which is found on the body. So the author is saying in the last ghusl of the body, you use kafur and you use uh, hot water if needed and you use ashnan if needed in order to remove some stubborn dirt. But again, soap can be used in place of that. The author he says, وَالْخِلَالُ يُسْتَعْمَلُوا إِذَا احْتِيجَ إِلَيْهِ and khilal, which is a type of um, ud, which is a type of wood, okay, it is used to clean between the teeth if there is a need for that to be done. And also the mustache is trimmed off the person and the nails are cut and also the armpit hairs are removed if they need to be removed. Subhanallah, you look here at the takrim, at the honor that Bani Adam, the sons and daughters of Adam are given, even in death. But the sad thing is that many of the sons and daughters of Adam, they don't do the sunan of fitrah whilst they are alive. We don't want to be in a situation where we die, where our body is not in a good, clean state. So we should be careful to always ensure that we take care of the sunan of fitrah, which need to be done. So the moustache is trimmed, the nails are cut, the armpit hairs are removed, uh, al-ibat, but the halq uh, al-ana is not allowed. The removing of the pubic hair is forbidden as the touching of aura without need is not allowed. Okay, The touching of the aura in that manner is not allowed as mentioned by Sheikh Hamad al-Hamad in his explanation of Zahad. The author he says, وَلَا يُسَرَّحُ شَعْرَهُ And the hair of the dead person is not to be combed, is not to be combed and straightened out. Why is this the case? Why is it makru to comb the hair of the dead person? Question to yourselves. It's makru, the ulama, they say it's makru to comb the hair of the dead person because the hair may fall out and then this is removing something from the body which doesn't need to be removed. Okay, So it's makru to do that, to straighten the hair and to comb the hair because the hair may fall out. The author, he says, And then the body after the ghusl is dried. The reason it's dry is to prevent the shrouding, the coffin, from becoming wet. Okay, The author, he says, and with regards to the woman's hair, it's, um, it's braided into three plates. Okay? It's braided into three plaits and it's left to fall down from behind her head. Okay? If after having washed the body seven times, uh, some najasa comes out, some filth, excrements or urine comes out from the private parts then that is to be cleaned and those private parts are to be stuffed and blocked with uh, cotton 
okay, in order to prevent anything else from coming out. The author he says, If after having put in the cotton to block those private parts and prevent any najasa from coming out, if that doesn't do the job, then you would go to a type of clay. You would use a strong type of clay to, bro- to block the private passages so nothing else can come out. Then the uh, area where the najasa came out would be washed thoroughly and wudu would be made again for that person. If after having shrouded the body, let's say the body was shrouded even if it was washed less than seven times, if it was shrouded after washing three times, because at that point the people they found that the body was clean. So after three times they shrouded the body. But after having shrouded the body, then some najasa came out, some more impurity came out, some filth came out. Then in this situation, uh, the body is not to be repeated with regards to ghusl. Ghusl is not to be given again. Why is ghusl not to be given again even though the body was washed less than seven times? Why do you think? Once the shrouding has been put on, why is the ghusl not to be given again if something else comes out? The ulama, they say, because this is mashaqqa, uh, this is difficulty upon the people to remove the shroud once again and then to uh, make the ghusl all over again. And it goes against the sunnah, which is ta'jil, the sunnah which is to rush with regards to the funeral rites. It would delay the funeral rites even more so. So in this situation, the body would be left as it is. Okay. Uh, the author he says, وَمُحْرِمٌ مَيِّتٌ كَحَيٍّ يُغَسَّلُ بِمَاءٍ وَصِدْرٍ وَلَا يُقَرَّبُ طيب. The person who is in a state of ihram and dies in that situation, then this person is to be washed like the normal dead person is to be washed. Except that the exception is that they will not be given طيب. They will not be given any type of perfume, any type of kafir or any other uh, thing which emanates a nice smell. Okay? He says, وَلَا يُلْبَسُوا ذَكَرُ الْمَخِيدِ And the male from amongst the pilgrim in ihram that had died, is not to be shrouded in makhit. Makhit is that uh, which has stitching in a way which shows the shape of the body parts. وَلَا يُغَطَّ رَأْسُهُ And the head of that person is not to be covered. وَلَا وَجْهُ أُنْثَى And with regards to the woman, her face is not to be covered, right? But her head can be covered. So the man's face uh, can be covered but not his head. The woman's head is to be covered but not her face. The author he says, وَلَا يُغَسَّلُوا شَهِيدٍ The shaheed is not to be washed. Shaheed al-Ma'raka. It's referring to the shaheed al-Ma'raka. Shaheed al-Ma'raka is the one who died from injuries on the battlefield. They actually die on the battlefield from injuries, right? So this person is not to be washed. Why? What's the Allah here? What's the reason? Taib. So these honorable people, they will be from the best of creation on the Day of Judgment and Allah will honor them in a way that their, uh, their injuries will still be bleeding, right? And they will come with the effects of that blood on their body and it will uh, emanate with a strong, beautiful smell that everybody will be able to smell and people will see them from a distance and know that these people were the ones who sacrificed themselves for the sake of Allah Azawajal, for His pleasure. So it will be a sign of honor for them. So this honor is not to be washed away from their bodies. And also the one who was killed um, unjustly, this person is also not to be washed. Okay, so the Prophet وسلم, he said in the hadith collected by Imam Ahmad, Abi Dawood, and authenticated by Ibn Mulaqan in Badal Munir, the Prophet وسلم, said, Man qutila duna malihi shaheed. Whoever is killed whilst defending his wealth, then that person is a shaheed. So this person was killed unjustly. And whoever is killed defending his religion, then this person is also a shaheed. And whoever is killed uh, defending his uh, own being, then this person is a shaheed. And whoever is killed in defense of his family, then this person is also a shaheed. So the person who is killed out of um, unjustly, then this person also is not to be washed the same way that the Shaheed al maraka is not to be washed. However, as a second opinion, Imam Ibn al Qudama held that the one killed uh, Dhulman unjustly is to be washed. Okay? 
the author he says illa in yakuna junaban okay unless this person or the shaheed was in a state of janaba okay if the shaheed al-ma'raka is in a state of janaba he is to be given a um a ghusl so if it was known that the person it was in a state of janaba when they died there to be given a ghusl why what is the proof of this does anybody know طيب, this happened to handala radiallahu anhu that he was washed by the angels because it was told by his wife that he had left from her bed without without taking ghusl and then the angels they washed Handala radiyallahu anhu so based upon that the Hanbali scholars they say that this Shaheed al-Ma'raka if, if it's known that he's in state of Janaba then this person is to be washed the author he says and the Shaheed al-Ma'raka the Shaheed that died he's to be buried in his clothing after having removed the weaponry the uh, protective weaponry the protective clothing sorry and the protective leather that's on this person after having removed that from the body then whatever clothing is left with the shaheed he's to be buried in that clothing again because that clothing is likely to have blood and it would be uh, he would be raised in that clothing as a sign of honor on the day of judgment and if the person is found not to have enough clothing then he is given a, a, a kafan he's given a shroud other than that clothing and the salah is not to be prayed on the shaheed. Why is the salah not to be prayed on the shaheed al ma'raka? Why is the salat al janazah not to be prayed on shaheed al ma'raka? So the ulama they say a beautiful point. They say la al hikmah fi dalik. Perhaps the wisdom in that and the salah shafaa lil musalli alayhi that sh- that the salah is an intercession from those who are praying over the shaheed. Right? Wa shaheed yufar lahu kulla shayin illa dain. And the shaheed all of his sins are forgiven for him except for a debt therefore he doesn't need people to pray upon him and they say these beautiful words that the one who is a shaheed he is much higher in status than anybody who is below him to come and to pray for him so the shaheed is in no need for anybody's intercession because Allah Azawajal is going to give him immense rewards in the hereafter. All his sins are forgiven and he is the one who will be interceding for 70 members of his family. Subhanallah. The author he says, وَإِن سَقَطَ عَنْ دَابَتِهِ أَوْ وُجِدَ مَيِّتًا وَلَا أَثَرَ بِهِ If this shaheed al-ma'raka, the one who was in the battlefield, if he was found having fallen off his riding beast, okay, and he's dead, or he's found, um, dead without the uh, without the injuries uh, alluding to the reason for his death so if the person falls off the be- of the riding beast in the battlefield and he's dead or he's found dead but without any injuries which allude to him dying from those injuries then this person is n- is not to take the rulings of the shaheed al ma'raka this person is given a ghusl and he's prayed over the reason being because the ghusl and the prayer is the asl is the foundation and here there's no evidence to remove the foundation to lift him to the state of, of being shaheed al ma'raka whereby he wouldn't be prayed on nor would he be made ghusl for so it's left in its original state of a dead person which is that ghusl should be given and that prayer should be done over this person the author he says fa'ukila, or this person who was on the battlefield he had many injuries right so he couldn't really move and continue the fight. So he's taken off the battlefield. And having been taken off the battlefield, he's able to eat. So if he's able to eat, this is a sign according to Hanbali Fuqaha that he still has enough life in him. So if he was able to eat and after eating, then he died, he's not to be given the rulings of the shaheed in the dunya, meaning that he would still be washed and he would be prayed over. أو طال بقاؤه عرفا غسل وصلي عليه or the person who is taken off the battlefield due to his injuries, he manages to be alive for another um, long amount of time according to the customary norm, then this person is also given ghusl and is also preyed upon. So his reward with Allah is a shaheed, but the ahkam, the rulings of the shaheed, is not given to him in the dunya. The author he says, وَسَقْتُ إِذَا بَلَغَ أَرْبَةَ أَشْرٍ غُسِلَ وَصُلِّيَ That the uh, fetus f- from the miscarriage, if it is four months of more, four months or more, then the fetus from the miscarriage is washed upon and prayed upon. Okay? And also the, prof, uh, the author says, Man ta'adra ghusluhu uh, yummima 
that whoever uh, is unable to have ghusl for that person, then tayammum is made for that person. So you may, may Allah protect all the Muslims, you may find somebody who has died due to being burnt in a fire. So the body is going to be in a very bad situation. So if water is put on that body, it's going to cause the body to decompose and to be in a very ugly and unpresentable situation. So in this situation, the body would be not be washed, uh, rather uh, tayammum would be made for that person. So anybody has a skin disease of, uh, of a very bad nature or is burnt, may Allah give us all a good and, a good and easy end. Ameen. Another riwayah in the madhab, as mentioned by Sheikh Ahmed Khalil, before we quickly finish, is that the person in this situation who ghusl cannot be given to them, then tayammum is not given to them. Rather, they are buried as they are. Why? Because ghusl is to clean the body. A ghusl for the dead is to clean the body. And if ghusl cannot be given, then tayammum is not going to clean the appearance of the body. Right? So therefore the Sheikh is saying that in another opinion in the Madhab, then they say that neither tayammum should be given, nor ghusl should be given, rather the body is just buried in that situation. The author he says, وَعَلَى الْغَاسِلْ سَتْرُ مَا رَآهُ إِنْ لَمْ يَكُنْ حَسَنًا That the persons who are washing the body, they should conceal anything that they see which is not nice, which is not a sign of a good ending, or anything which Yes, basically it's not a sign of a good ending. Why? Because the Prophet ﷺ said in the hadith of Ahmad, مَنْ سَطَرَ مُسْلِمًا فِي الدُّنْيَا سَطَرَهُ اللَّهِ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ Whoever conceals the faults of a Muslim in this world, then Allah will conceal his faults in the hereafter. So for example, some people due to their sins when they die, may Allah protect us, the faces become dark. So it's not permissible to tell people of this, unless the ulama say, unless the person was known to be spreading evil innovation, meaning that he was uh, a person who was out there calling to innovation and teaching innovation, major innovation, then this person can be spoken about as a way of warning people that his end yani, was such and such. So avoid the manhaj, the methodology that he was upon. Or if a person, uh, something scary happened to a person and it's not going to be known who this person was if you tell people about the story of what you saw when you watched this person. Then it's also allowed to tell people so that people can take a lesson from that and admonition and learn to fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as he deserves to be fair. And also what can be told is that the person when he or she passes away, that signs of goodness are found on that person, like a beautiful smell is emanating from that person's body or bright um, uh, shiny face is emanating from that person's. Uh, body for example then this can be told uh, with the name of the person so that the people would make more dua for this person and uh, seek more forgiveness for this person due to the uh, fact that it was known that this person died in a pleasing sight to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sallallahu alayhi um, we'll stop here inshallah and I apologize I don't have time to take questions because the salah is very close if you have any questions please post them to me as a private message or you can post them on the fit group. Wa jazakumullah khair. May Allah azza wa jal reward of all of us immensely. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa sallamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.